it truly is an honor to launch this Distinguished Lecture Series, and particularly for Margaret and Terry. Um, we have, I've had the privilege in working with Alice over the last four years to um, meet many collectors. Some people I've known for years, others are, are, are new acquaintances. Um, we've also seen numerous private collections. I can tell you that you have, I think, the most exquisite um, collection in American art at the Stentz home, and uh, I know they've been generous uh, donors to this institution, and it is uh, it seems perfect for Crystal Bridges to develop a relationship with the High Museum. I think that we will truly be two anchors of, of uh, Southern museums in the United States, and uh, it really is a, a privilege to, to uh, talk with you today about this new project. Crystal Bridges was announced in May of 2005 by Alice Walton as a new art institution and cultural center for the central part of the United States. We are um, a part of a, an MSA, a Metropolitan Statistical Area of um, a, um, excuse me, we're part of a Metropolitan Statistical Area of about 500,000 people. And this wonderful project is going to bring a whole level, a new level of uh, visual arts and um, other cultural offerings within our area. The building is a work of the architect Moisha Softy. It's a series of seven pavilions that surrounds two bodies of water. We're doing um, probably the most complicated museum we could have dreamed of. We're building it in a stream bed um, and taking three years to do it during a lot of rain. And uh, it is going to yield a really spectacular place. Uh, this afternoon, I want to give you an overview of what our project is going to be, the collection that we've been developing, uh, some of the loans that we have out, and then talk to you some about the architecture itself and what it means for our region. Um, we are here, right in the center of this bullseye. Now, the center of the United States is actually over here, but um, I think it helps some people who are geographically challenged have a better sense of where we are. Um, we are not in the middle of nowhere. We have um, seven million people within a three-hour car drive of Crystal Bridges. A uh, colleague of mine was at College Art Association last week in Dallas and heard a prominent American art historian make the statement that um, we didn't deserve great art out here because enough people didn't live here. And uh, I think one of the things that makes me so excited about this crusade is, is to um, make everyone realize um, how rich our culture is, our visual culture, and that it really is something that needs to be accessible to everyone. Um, if you go out five and a half hours, you hit Dallas and Fort Worth, um, you go to St. Louis. So we're in an area of several million people. And it's a very easy one-hour flight from here. Now, the Ozarks are an area that are known, that's known for its natural beauty. And uh, it is an area that uh, is celebrated for its streams, its hiking, all of its outdoor activities. And that's an aspect that was very important to us when we were developing the concept for this new art museum. We really have as a goal the integration of art and nature. And I mentioned briefly, our metropolitan statistical area is about a half a million people. It's been noted um, as the sixth fastest growing MSA in the United States, uh, spotlighted for its quality of life and uh, the amenities that um, we have available to us. We've got a traditional visual culture and uh, performing culture in, in craft primarily, in uh, folk music. Um, and it is celebrated primarily in, um, in the areas of uh, festivals and those kinds of activities. Within our um, area in Fayetteville, we have the Walton Art Center, which has been around for 20 years. It's our performing arts venue and uh, a project that was created by a, actually a very innovative collaboration between the city of Fayetteville, the University of Arkansas, and private partnership. Um, 
So this is the context in which um, art has been flourishing in our region. We're probably best known for our architecture. Uh, this is work of Ife Jones. Some of you have probably seen photographs of um, Thorn Crown Chapel in Eureka Springs. This is um, Thorn Crown. Um, Jones was a, a student of um, Frank Lloyd Wright and studied at Taliesin. Uh, he came back to the Ozarks and taught at the university and developed his own um, vernacular architecture that celebrates this um, integration of, of the building space within the natural setting. And for those of you that have looked at our plans, um, particularly the, the original concept for our Great Hall and Crystal Bridges, Faye Jones is definitely an inspiration that Moisha Safi was paying attention to. In the visual arts, there are a few noted, arch uh, a noted artists who live in our area. Um, probably um, most significant is Anita Huffington, uh, a sculptor who uh, was in New York City for uh, part of her career and then moved to the Ozarks and has been working there for about 40 years now. Um, one of my favorites is Donald Roller Wilson. Um, he has these fabulous, whimsical uh, paintings that he does. The one on the left is called Holly, seen about ready to get way too hot from 1904. And on the right is Cookie, dressed for her birthday party. Um, Donald Roller Wilson was born in Texas, but uh, raised in Fayetteville and has been living there most of his life. Um, in a review in the New York Times in 1999, his work was described as, quote, Donald Roller Wilson's goofy, hallucinogenic, old master style paintings of monkeys, dogs, and cats dressed up in antique costumes may be kish, but it's a high quality kish, like good beach reading, end quote. So this is the, uh, a, a very quick, overview of the visual arts scene in our area um, when Crystal Bridges was announced two years ago. Um, it will change dramatically when we open our doors in uh, um, 2010 or thereabouts. This is a uh, CAD rendering of one of our bridge buildings and while I know there's probably registrars in this room, um, we are going to have a lot of light filtration and things like that. Let me go back here. Um, but um, this is a, a CAD of one of the, the North Bridge building where we're actually building gallery boxes uh, with their own ceilings within the context of the larger bridge building. So it's a, it's a very innovative uh, approach. I bring you greetings from Alice Walton. She would have liked to have been here, but um, I I bring her visage instead and a little video clip at the end. Um, Alice is very much our founder. Um, she has been committed to both art and education um, for much of her adult life. I met her through a wonderful grant that we developed when I was at the Eamon Carter Museum. Um, Alice funds the opportunity for every K through 12 child in her county in West Texas to go to Fort Worth for, for both an experience at the Performing Arts Hall as well as the Eamon Carter Museum twice a year. It also funds pre and post tour distance learning um, and um, interaction with teachers in the classrooms from the museums and the Performing Arts venue. So she's someone who is, is truly committed to the power of arts education. And through that, um, that grant, we became acquainted and um, share a real commitment to um, providing access to, to the highest quality art. Now, this project is supported um, by other members of the Walton family as well um, and the Walton Family Foundation. And let's see here. There we go. Over the years, my family has been thinking about ways to give back to this community and a wider community that means so much to us. We think we've arrived at another project 
that will benefit this community and the region and the state and hopefully the nation. As many of you know, it, I've had a lifelong love of history and art and education. And this project will meld those three pieces. What we're announcing today is our plan to build a world-class American Art Museum and Cultural Center right here in Bentonville. And one aspect, as is noted in this slide and the quote from Alice, is a real desire to um, make art also as a um, entry point, particularly for students, to American history and, um, and uh, American cultural ideals. So as we look at some of the selections that we've made in acquisitions, um, I think you'll see some of the tie-in um, that we're working towards. Now, it's uh, fair to say that a somewhat healthy debate has been um, uh, initiated by our activities. Um, there are um, people who feel that there is a propriety of place for great works of art, and we have challenged that through um, some of our acquisitions processes. Um, for this next slide, to make any sense for you, though, uh, you have to have some knowledge of college football. This refers, of course, to our acquisition of the Constable Hamilton portrait of George Washington that was sold by the New York Public Library at auction. Um, and there was a, 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 a cartoonist at the Democrat Gazette in Little Rock who did a series of cartoons on us um, over the two years. He, he's since left um, Arkansas, and I think he's working in Tennessee now. I uh, show his cartoons periodically in talks, and. Uh, he heard about that, and about a year ago I got a call, and he said, you know, I've got these originals. Would you guys like them for the museum? And I said, absolutely. So he, Mr. Cox sent us all his original drawings. So it's, uh, it's really terrific. And um, I'm not going to do the Woo Pig Suey, but I think probably enough of you watch football that you know what it sounds like. Now, to, to get serious, I want to talk just a little bit about a few key works that we've announced. Um, it is a challenge to talk about Crystal Bridges because we've been very secretive um, about our acquisitions activity. And we've, we're doing that by design, um, in part to build some suspense, in part to keep, well, primarily to keep a lot of dealers guessing. And, um, but um, those things that we have announced, we've tried to announce because of um, uh, using those works in, in loan activity or something like that. And so I'll be talking about a few of the major pictures tonight. It'll give you a, a sample and a little taste of what our collection is like. On the left is our Charles Wilson Peel George Washington from um, 1780 to 82. On the right is George Washington at Princeton, uh, also by Peel from 1779. This painting, uh, the, the full length, is in the U.S. Senate. Um, our work is of Washington at Yorktown where the Continental Army defeated um, Cornwallis and made a, a, a major shift in, um, in the Continental Army's uh, successes against the British. In fact, it led to um, the secret negotiations that ultim ultimately resulted in the Treaty of Paris. Um, it was also a battle, the Battle of Yorktown, that symbolized the U.S. relationship with France. And um, that relationship had a, obviously an, a major, a major uh, contribution to the change in the war. The painting um, just prior to the Yorktown cam uh, campaign, Washington, George Washington had met the Chevalier de Chasselot. And I show you a portrait of, of Chasselot over here. And this is not in our collection. Uh, he was major general and chief of staff for Rochambeau's French army in America and acted as a translator between Rochambeau and George Washington. Crystal Bridges' portrait of George Washington is one of two three-quarter length versions painted by Peel between 1780 and 1782. Uh, we know that Chasselot um, took one version with him back to France um, the other one was purchased by Rochambeau. Um, our painting resided at this Chateau de Chasseleur in France until uh, 2004 when it was sold at auction. 
purchased by the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, Washington and Chasseleur had a, a, a very um, um, warm relationship and uh, exchanged letters um, throughout the rest of, of, of their life. Chasseleur only lived a few more years, but it was a rich correspondence. And um, some scholars of Washington's letters say that they are some of his most emotional. So there, it was, there was an important tie between these two, um, two great uh, men. And it is a real honor to have this, this portrait that has such an important tie to our history. Now, Peel, who painted the painting, um, had firsthand experience with Washington because he was a member of the Continental Army. Um, Peel began, began his career painting miniatures, as many of you may know, and you have a great Peel in your collection here. He worked with, uh, briefly with uh, Copley up in Boston. Uh, Copley encouraged him to go to London and study. He earned enough money and went and studied with Benjamin West while in London. After two years, he returned and came back to the U.S., enlisted in the Continental Army, and was actually with Washington uh, near Trenton and participated in the westward, westward crossing of the Delaware River with Washington. Now, Peel launched um, his portraiture, his, his full-length portraiture um, career through his Washington portraits and um, was also very much a businessman. He, he made several of them. And in our case, um, he repurposed one of his York, uh, one of his earlier pictures from the Battle of Princeton is underneath our detail of the Battle of Yorktown. So in X-ray, he so obviously he was producing you know these prior to getting clients, and when he had his two French clients, he he quickly made the Battle of uh, Princeton into the Battle of Yorktown. These are two portraits by um, the American painter uh, Charles Bird King. One is, um, the one on the left is a Tui half cheap husband of Eagle of Delight, and the other is Waikiki Chai Yankee Chief. Thomas McKinney, United States Superintendent of Indian Trade in Georgetown, conceived of the idea of developing a government collection of portraits of prominent Indians who visited Washington. McKinney engaged the services of Charles Bird King, a well-known Washington portraitist who'd studied under Benjamin West. These portraits were later handsomely reproduced as colored lithographs in, McKinney, in Thomas McKinney and James Hall's three volumes, History of American of Indian Tribes in North America, published in 1837. King's Indian Gallery, of which these were a part, were transferred to the Smithsonian Institution in 1858 when the National Institute was uh, formally disbanded and its collection dispersed. Joseph Henry, the first secretary of the Smithsonian, placed the portraits in the art gallery, the second floor of the Smithsonian building. Um, on the night of January 24th, 1865, fire consumed that building and destroyed 291 works. Now, fortunately, King had made copies of many of these works, and um, these are a pair that would have been of the copies that were acquired by the Redwood Library in Newport, um, deaccessioned by the Redwood Library, I believe, in the 1960s, and then resold, and uh, we bought them about three years ago. Now, they are the basis for which Thomas McKinney created a very important document that I mentioned earlier, this uh, history of Indian, uh, the North American Indians. Now, McKinney used Henry Inman, the artist, to create larger copies of the Charles Bird Kings from which McKinney and Hall made the, uh, the lithographic um, works and you own this fabulous, oops, let me back up here. I keep thinking that's the laser pointer here. You own this fabulous um, Inman, um, Yohola Miko. Close? Good. Um, and I wanted to show this because, you know, one of the things that's so fun in our, in our industry is, is looking at ways we can work with other museums. And frankly, you know, 
I don't have intimate knowledge of your American collection, but I've been here and looking at and your catalogs and your website. I mean, there's wonderful things that we can do together, and this is just one tiny little example of, of um, you know, the kind of wonderful collaborations that we can we can put together. So, someday uh, um, we, w we we may very well do a a uh, uh, King and Inman show or something like that. I show you here a work by Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate called The Life of a Hunter, A Tight Fix from 1856. Quote, we have not seen a painting for some time which has pleased us so much, end quote, wrote a columnist in the New York Herald when the work was singled out for praise at the National Academy of Design in 1858. Trained as a lithographer and painter in Liverpool, England, Tate came to this country in search of an audience. He brought with him his um, interest and knowledge of English sporting pictures and introduced that subject to audiences in the United States. For Tate, his area was upstate New York, um, the upper Adirondacks, uh, very interested in hunting and fishing in particular. In the case of this work, Tate was also um, drawing from local lore and popular humor. Contemporary with this work is a famous uh, piece of Ad Adirondack folk poetry, Allen's Bear Fight Up in Keene is the title. Allen was a local newspaper editor who also served as the census taker. Uh, trudging through the woods during a census, Allen met a bear and her two cubs. Lacking a gun, he held her off with a large stick and after a fearful struggle, managed to kill the bear with his knife. An unknown poet captured the climax of the struggle with the following, and this is just one stanza of a, of a much larger poem. Against the rock with great strength, he held her out at his arm's length. Oh God, he cried in deep despair, if you don't help me, don't help the bear. Um, there, is, there are some theories also that um, the Tate may relate to um, southeastern humor. Um, at which time the southeast would have been areas like Arkansas and Louisiana, and um, some references to Daniel Boone. Um, so um, that painting will be one of 50 um, American narrative paintings of the 19th century that will be in an exhibition that the Metropolitan's doing, and it opens in 2009. So uh, we're very excited about that. Now, this is one of our probably more celebrated acquisitions. This is the, what some people called our consolation prize. So, um, this is by Thomas Aikens, his great portrait of Professor Benjamin Howard Rand from 1874. And um, that's actually quite a good slide. Um, we've had it rephotographed, and um, you can actually now kind of see it. It, 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 it. Where it was at, hanging for about 100 years, it was very hard to see, but uh, it's really quite a, quite a spectacular painting. Thomas Aikens set a new standard for realism and figure painting in America in the last quarter of the 19th century. As a somewhat controversial figure, Aikens, Aikens ignored public convention in his rigorous examination of the human form and left a monumental impact on American art through his studies, his students, and his own art. Dr. Rand is Aikens' earliest portrait subject outside his close circle of family and friends. Rand was Aikens' chemistry teacher in high school and later led a distinguished career teaching at Jefferson Medical College. This monumental canvas depicts the quiet scholar at work in his study, surrounded by the trappings of his profession and interests. Optimistic about his future as a portrait painter, Aikens portrays the distinguished physician boldly, unconventionally, and with kind humor. You see him there with his scientific instruments on this side, focusing on his book and just nonchalantly petting his cat who's staring straight out at us. Um, one of the things we really like about this painting is, is are these precise, uh, this precise still life element which um, suggests Aiken's um, teaching um, artists such as uh, William Harnett and James Pito. Let's see here. Now this is, a, this is the problem with the internet. You can grab 
things off anywhere, and often they're not very good. But this is Aiken's self-portrait that's at the National Academy of Design. And this, of course, is, is a great painting, the Gross Clinic. Soon after painting Dr. Rand, Aikens turned his attention to his masterpiece, The Gross Clinic. The celebrated work was conceived in part for the exhibition in the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Its shocking realism backfired and was rejected from that prestigious venue. The portrait of Benjamin Howard Rand was accepted instead and eventually Aiken, but eventually Aikens managed to get The Gross Clinic exhibited in the medical building. Um, we have this great painting now on loan to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This is one of my personal favorites of our collection. Uh, George Bellows' Excavation at Night from uh, 1908. Bellows arrived in New York City from Columbus, Ohio in 1904 with the intent of becoming an illustrator. Enrolled at the New York School of Arts, Bellows quickly became under the influence of his teacher, Robert Henry. Henry espoused an approach to art that was immediate, direct, and of subjects of everyday life. Eventually dubbed the Ashcan School for their uh, preference for the more gritty side of urban life, uh, Bellows enthusiastically embraced Henry's precepts and focused on major subjects that were well known at the time. Excavation at night is the excavation for Penn Station, or Pennsylvania Station, that opened in 1910. It was, our painting was the second of four versions. This, the first version owned by the Brooklyn Museum shows the pit during the daytime. Uh, this is the rail line. Um, one thing about this project uh, that we, um, that was a great note is the fact that this was the first large-scale excavation under the Hudson River. Um, this was at the time of the Panama Canal, and um, during the six years of excavation to create Pen uh, Pennsylvania Station, there were often references to this being um, um, the North American version of the Panama Canal. So as a subject, um, Aikens, I'm sorry, um, Bellows was, was extremely aware of the modernity, um, the very contemporary quality of, of, of what he was painting and uh, produced it in this really magnificent, expressive work. Uh, it's quite a large painting and um, has this fabulous mixture of the blues of the sky and the hauntiness of this tenement row that um, almost looks uh, anthropomorphic looking out over this, this huge excavation. Now, to, for those who think we stopped at uh, 1910, we don't. Um, our most recent um, announcement has been the um, commissioning of James Terrell to do a sky piece for us. Um, this is Terrell's concept for uh, our work. Um, and many of you may be familiar with his other sky pieces. There's one at the Nasher um, Sculpture Museum in Dallas. There's a, a, a beautiful small one at uh, Cheekwood in, in Nashville. Um, this is a double, a double oculus experience, somewhat similar to Roden Crater, except on a, of course, much, much smaller scale. Um, at the top, it's on a sloped hillside. At the top, um, you will sit along here and you can lean back and experience the sky, or you can enter at this level here into um, the oculus and uh, look up through the opening there. Um, we're working to open this piece prior to the museum's opening in 2010, um, in part to begin to um, animate a connection between our downtown and the museum site. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, I, I learned from, uh, from David that your, your Inman is, is actually in this show as well. And um, we've been lending our art all over the world. Um, this is um, our George Washington at uh, Shanghai, I think, the, the Fine Arts Museum in Shanghai. Um, this is George on the banner going into the Pushkin in Moscow, and he's now at Bilbao. Um, so we've been, um, we try to be a generous lender um, while the museum is being built. 
uh, we own a, an important suite of colonial portraits, the Levy Franks portraits, um, done around 1735, attributed to the Dutch artist um, Gerardus uh, Dijkink. Um, this group of portraits, if, you, if any of you saw the PBS um, um, Jews in America series, um, these portraits were featured in the first episode. Uh, this is Abigail Levy, oops, sorry about that. This is Abigail Levy Franks here. Um, she um, was the wife and mother of, of um, mother of six children. One of, her, one of her sons went to England early on, and uh, for 30 years she wrote him these beautiful, passionate letters and described life in America and the establishment of the Jew Jewish community in the United States. And um, th that, those letters have been published uh, repeatedly. Um, they're very important in um, early American history and early Ju American Jewish history as well. And uh, we're we, the Jewish Museum is showing them in, in pairs. Um, uh, every year they switch them out between now and the time we open. Um, our, we have a very interesting picture of Lafayette that we're, we're real pleased with. This is Samuel F. B. Morris's lifetime portrait of uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, it's currently in the show of our French founding fathers at the New York Historical Society. Um, this is a particularly important work because it's the only um, extant um, lifetime portrait that we have in this country. Uh, it was the basis for the full-length portrait then that Morris did that uh, hangs in City Hall in New York City. Um, it was done during Lafayette's 13-month um, um, tour of the United States that he made in, um, um, in 1825, 1824, excuse me. And here's Kindred Spirits, our painting by Asher B. Durand that depicts Thomas Cole here and William Cullen Bryant um, on the precipice um, looking over the beautiful Catskill landscape um, done as a um, um, homage to, um, uh, to Cole and um, an absolutely spectacular moment, probably one of the greatest moments in 19th century American landscape painting. Um, this was the picture that we bought through a private auction um, that was um, administered for the New York Public Library. Um, the way I understand it, they offered about 30, 30 different entities, individuals and institutions, the opportunity to write a number on a piece of paper, and the one with the highest number won and um, we were able to do that. And so we've had the picture on loan. Um, here it is at the National Gallery in Washington. Um, it's the centerpiece of an exhibition on Durand that is now at its final venue uh, in San Diego. And then we've, uh, we haven't announced it, but uh, it will be loaned to New York City, to a museum in New York City, then um, until we open Crystal Bridges. Um, this is Stephen Hull's fabulous addition to the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City, one of the truly um, amazing pieces of new museum architecture out there. And we lent uh, them our Cropsey Backwoods of America from um, 1858. Um, this is a um, Dennis Miller bunker painting of a woman named Ann Page from 1887. And it is currently on loan to the Seattle Art Museum. And this is the old Venturi building at the Seattle Art Museum with a Jonathan Borofsky in front of it. And uh, she's a, a bunkers up, a really interesting artist and someone that, oops, sorry about that, someone that I, I, I hope gets a lot more attention. Um, there's been a, a wonderful bunker show done a few years ago, but uh, he died at a very early age and um, was an extremely talented artist. And this is, I think, one of his real masterpieces. Um, this is a Mariah Oki Dewing painting, the wife of, um, of um, Thomas Dewing, yes. And uh, it is on loan now to the National Museum of Women and the Arts in Washington, D.C. A beautiful work called In the Garden from um, 19, 1904. Now, we're going to have great works of art on the wall, but just as, in, just as you do here, we intend for 
education to really be the foundation for our, for our museum. Um, I've had the privilege to uh, build uh, a wonderful staff. I've got my division heads in place. We're up to 12 people and we'll be about 100 full-time equivalent when we open. So I'd say probably about half the size of the High Museum in staff. Um, um, Lynn Berkowitz joined us from the Ringling Museum in Sarasota and uh, she's actively developing plans to, to make education the real centerpiece of what we are as an institution. We will be doing um, We'll have a school programs division, a community programs division, a public programs division, and then a professional programs division. One thing we're planning is um, um, our first major temporary exhibition will be a, a survey of Moisha Softy's architecture that we're doing with the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. And um, Lynn's developing an architecture institute that we'll be launching uh, simultaneously with that exhibition. And it will be a, a professional studies program for architects and landscape architects. So uh, we're very interested in lifelong learning and uh, really want to be a major force in the advancement of art education in this country. We also want to make it fun. I'm a real advocate for noise in the galleries and kids running around and people enjoying themselves. And uh, part of our philosophy has been to try to create an art museum experience that um, is a little bit outside the normal context. And for us, um, people are very comfortable in the landscape. There's a great deal of outdoor activity that goes on all the time. We're building the museum in a 100-acre park. We're putting in, we're, we'll be a major crossroad of bike trails. Uh, there'll be a lot of hiking. And it's, it's about um, giving people access points that um, at different comfort levels. Now, Moisha Softy is the architect we selected. Um, Moisha has a, um, a really brilliant career. He's, he's, he says he's one of these people that lived his life backwards. He, he had international fame when he was, I think, 29 years old. Uh, he was the architect of Habitat. Uh, we all remember that from the, the World's Fair in um, 1967. Um, but uh, in, in recent years, Softy's been involved in some uh, incredibly important projects. We found his architecture to be particularly engaging for us because he's uh, very responsive to site, to location. And um, he is someone, when you look at his, his buildings, um, they are fully integrated into the, into the, the context in which they're presented. And, and uh, while there's certain material similarities, they can also be dramatically different one location to another. Um, this is a, a model, a photograph of a model of his Marina Bay Sands project. You'll all be hearing a lot about this in, in a couple of years when it opens. This is a uh, $4.8 billion project in Singapore. Um, they've, this is all rec reclaimed land. Um, it is, I think it's 2 million square feet here. These are 50-story towers. There's a full urban park up on top. Um, and two museums. So this project is underway in Singapore right now. Um, and this, um, it, these are two, this, some, some uh, slides and a, a, sh an, a, sh a shot of one end of Yad Vashem, which is the National Holocaust Museum in Israel. So uh, Moshe is um, doing some really spectacular things. Um, here's Moshe in a mule. Um, with Alice and Buddy Philpot, and this is Crystal Bridges. Um, this is Crystal Pond. This is where the name starts. Everybody wants to know where's the name come from. And um, there is a, our our water feature is fed by three natural springs. Uh, the most beautiful being this particular one here. And by the time we get it cleaned up and, and ready, um, it, is, it is deep blue and it runs year round, uh, very cold, very deep water. Um, let's see. This gives you a better sense of the project. Uh, this is a topo of, of, of the hillside. And our buildings are literally integrated right into the hill. And then this is the stream bed in which the, the bridge buildings are built and the ponds are made. This is our town square. And I don't know if you, that's about a block there. So 
three blocks or so, you come to a little botanic gardens that the, the foundation built about three years ago. And from that, we're developing a sculpture trail. The James Terrell will sit right there. And you can walk up and go along the water and come in the south entrance to the museum. Um, if you drive, you'll come in here. It's about a half a mile uh, on the road. And you'll park. And the project reveals itself in stages. It's, a, it's seven layers of building on, uh, going down into this, into this valley. So you arrive at the top, park, come out to this overlook where you'll see this part of the project. You'll enter down into a courtyard, into the main lobby. This is a dining pavilion. And then the galleries flow through here over to this side, about 32,000 square feet of gallery space. Um, we have six classrooms on this level and a plaza. Um, this is our main administration building and library. And then this is our great hall, which is a multi-purpose space. Um, we're around 125,000 square feet of usable space. And I think statistically that kind of puts us right about average for art museums in this country. Considerably smaller than you are, but uh, this is where we're going to grow from. This is our, we, I call it the knuckle, but um, it's, a, it's a very difficult site to work in. And the only access we'll have after we finish is, is over here. And so any future expansion of the museum will happen at this direction. So we went ahead and planned for that by making the connection. The palette is very simple. It's architectural concrete, Ipe wood that's inserted. Uh, this is southern pine for the beams that carry all the way through. And then the, the uh, roof is, is copper with uh, the glass skylights. And then this is showing the Great Hall. This is a space, uh, it's about 6,000 square feet. So it'll hold you know, 300 people for a dinner or seven or 800 for a reception. And again, this outlines some of the major categories. It'll look spectacular at night, although I'm really worried about this because the Clinton Library looks spectacular at night too, and it sits on a river and it has bugs all over it. So we're already talking about how we're going to keep this thing clean, and uh, we'll be looking for full-time window washers. Um, again, the park is a big piece of this and how we integrate ourselves into the park um, for general recreational activities. I'm going to tell on us, Michael. Michael and I went over to look at the Noguchi playground before the lecture today, and uh, that's the kind of thing that we would love to see incorporated into our park. Um, so I'm not saying we're going to replicate your Noguchi playground, but we really would love to find a, a major artist playground that we could put in as part of this. And then Reed Hildebrand are our um, landscape architects. They are working among their many projects right now is the Clark Art Institute's uh, Tadao Ando expansion. Um, there's some similarities there with us. This is along the, the uh, drive going in. And of course, we are known for dogwoods. And so this, the, the spring will be quite spectacular. Um, this is the pond walk. Um, so as you're, as you're coming from town, you'll, if you decide to walk in, you'll have this opportunity to come along the river, uh, along the stream. Um, we're currently in construction. We've been uh, working in the ground for about 15 months. It's been a very challenging site. We, we ran into some serious problems in the excavation and had to redesign some of the foundations. Um, the actual footprint of the buildings, you can kind of see here, this is where that curved building would be. Uh, the courtyard or that plaza area would be here. This is one bridge building the other bridge, and the Great Hall will sit there. Uh, the site covers seven acres. Um, one thing I want to point out is um, the closeness of the tree line. Uh, we took great care in maintaining the forest uh, as carefully as we could. Uh, the initial cut was, is five feet back from the building edge. And then any trees that, are, that, are, that need to come out after that, I have to personally approve. So um, they have, the, the contractors have been very, very uh, um, good about that. And, and the point being that 
when we open the building, we want that forest to come right down and meet the building as closely as we can. Um, this is uh, the kind of problems we've been having. This is called soil nailing, where they dr they drill these huge rods into the into the into the hillside and spray concrete over it. Um, it's kind of deceptive. This is about 60 feet from here down to here. Um, this is uh, these are a pair of uh, tulip poplar trees that uh, we modified the design of the building to accommodate so we wouldn't have to cut them down. Uh, they've got all of this uh, reinforcing done around them and there's, you can't see it, but there are some cables that run that hold them up. Uh, soon after we had the, the, um, the cables installed, I was down on the site and the uh, superintendent told me that the, the workers nicknamed them Thelma and Louise because the whole point is whether or not Thelma and Louise are gonna jump or not. So um, some construction shots, we're pouring piers and have these tower cranes. The first tower cranes, I think, ever in Bentonville, uh, 247 feet. So pretty impressive for us. Um, we decided to go ahead and start programming so that we could engage our community, have an opportunity to have real dialogue with them, get some feedback, and from my perspective, build a team as a staff and actually have to meet deadlines, have to do openings, um, I go back in the morning because we have an opening tomorrow night. I have a press, I have a press preview at 11. So, you know, while it's a fraction of the size of what you guys do, it, it's great because it gets us going and it, it gets the community engaged. And so we've opened Crystal Bridges at the Massey, which is a, um, about uh, 1,500 square foot exhibition space. And um, it is really, um, it's becoming a real catalyst and that's very exciting to see uh, when we're still two and a half years out. Um, can you, yeah, we have, to, we have to play this a little differently here. My love of American art has enriched my life, and I've witnessed firsthand its transformative effects on others, particularly children and the underserved. Olana and Crystal Bridges stand as sister institutions in the forward movement to make great art available for everyone, especially art grounded by a sense of place. I challenge us all to support and celebrate the art and the artists of our past and of our present, and to make meaningful access to our cultural treasures a benefit for all. Thank you. Next. <laughs> there it is. Um, best way to keep tabs on us is through our website, crystalbridges.org. Um, we're very pleased with it. We've, it's actually our second version since we announced, and uh, we're trying to make it even more dynamic as we move forward. And uh, it's, a, it's just a great tool to, if you're interested in keeping up on our news. And I want to thank Terry and Margaret for making all this possible. These are pictures, I don't know if you recognize yourselves there, but uh, these were, were last November in New York. So thank you very much. And I'll take some questions if, you, if anyone has any. No questions? Okay. Yes. Well, we're usually pretty ev evasive. Is, are there any reporters? Are there any reporters in here? Um, we're, we have a few hundred right now. Um, we can open tomorrow. Uh, we've been we've been pretty aggressive. Uh, and Ms. Walton is a, has has had a private has been developing a private collection for about 25 years. So she has her own collection, and then um, the museum has been very busy. Um, so we're at that point of refinement now which is very gratifying. Yeah. Wait, uh, please wait for the mic. Oh, will you limit access like the Barnes had to? Oh, will we limit access? No, we want to be, we want to, we want to be overwhelmed. 
Um, one of the biggest challenges we have, in, in all candor, is, is getting a real grasp of um, the impact of visitation on our town, on our area. Um, I've had I've had a couple of studies done two years ago. I've got uh, I've commissioned another uh, attendance study and uh, economic impact study as well. But um, we think it'll be at least 250,000 people, and during that bubble of the first year or two, it may even be more significant than that. And so there are infrastructure issues and those kinds of things. Um, but we really do want this very much to be a place for everyone. I anticipate that we'll be free admission, um, probably charge for special exhibitions. Um, we want to develop, we will be developing a membership program and corporate program. There'll be giving opportunities, but um, very much directed towards specific programs like, like uh, education outreach, those kinds of things. Um, the community has embraced it. Um, I've got We've had a lot of uh, conversation. I meet, I meet once a week with our mayor and a group of other people so that you know, we, everybody keeps tabs on what's going on. We're, we're trying to build some parking garages. Um, the real surprise with this project is the location. When, when I started early work on this, um, I was looking at sites all over between Fayetteville and, and Bella Vista, all the way up and down the corridor, about 30-mile corridor. And I actually thought, several of us thought it was going to be located halfway between Fayetteville and Bentonville. And um, the surprise was that the family gave us their backyard, basically. Um, the, the land we're building on is family property where the family grew up, where the kids grew up. Alice used to ride her horse through there and stuff. And, um, and, and the great thing about it is that they had 200 acres right there near downtown, and the town grew up around it. And so now they're giving us 100 acres of that 200. And it's, it's creating a major urban park, um, particularly as we continue to grow. Um, we, we really are going to be a, a fairly large place in another 50, 20, uh, 50 you know, 75 years. So it's, it's going to be very special, I think, to have that much land um, right there in town. Yes? How far into the 20th or 21st century will the collection go and the special exhibitions program? Well, our exhibitions program will certainly be all-encompassing. And in fact, we're talking about um, exhibitions beyond American art. Other, um, I think that the art that we show of other cultures will be art that, is influ that, that influences American artists. Um, I, there needs to be some, I think, real ties there. But um, in, the 20, in the 20th century, um, we have work through the 20th century. Um, we're not collecting the, the New York School. Um, it, you know, it takes a different, it, it takes a different kind of building. Um, we're not staffed for that. And so I think what you're going to see when we open is that our second half of the 20th century are going to be those artists that are looking back at um, the 19th century and the 18th century for those connections. So I think, I think it, um, while I think there will be abstraction and modernism represented, I think that it's going to be works that are rooted in, in realism. Well, thank you so mm -hmm. much, thank Mr. Workman. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We will have the reception in Stent Atrium immediately following. And everyone needs a red sticker. And if you haven't got one, you can get one from Virginia on the green shirt. Thank you. Thank you.